be a follower of Christ. The confession of the master is where we're going to start out. And I'm coming from... Can you guys hear me? Can you hear? Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay, you can. All right. All right. We're going to start out in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 39. And it says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That sounds like a whole lot of stuff. But what it all sums up to is Jesus is first. Him and him alone takes first place in our lives. Over mom, dad, children, husband, wife, occupation, whatever it is, Jesus comes first. Amen? Amen. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. Because basically what he is saying here is you're either for me or you're against me. Jesus told them that he did not come with peace but with a sword. Because when you begin to stand up and live your life for Christ, there's some people that's going to walk away from you. They're going to tell you you're just as crazy as that man in that Bible that you're reading in. They are going to say, you truly believe that? Do you really think miracles, signs, and wonders still happen? They're going to say, yes, I do. And when you stand up and confess those things, then one day, when we all see the other side of this life, and it's time for Jesus to stand up and say, Father, this one here, she loved and adored me. She followed me all the days of her life. Here's a crown and a robe for her. That's what he's going to do for some of us. But for some of us, when that day comes, he's going to say, depart from me, for I do not know you. <laughs> and that is be because they denied him here on this earth. While they were here, they had opportunity to follow Jesus. They did not. Amen? Amen. So it should be understood that when God confronts a person with Christ, it's not by law or philosophy. From which we can select parts which we accept or reject. So we have to also understand that we can't just say, oh, I'm just going to believe this part of the Bible and not that part. We either believe it all or we believe nothing. Right. There's a scripture in there that he says, I would rather you be cold or hot, but not lukewarm. We don't straddle a thing. You're either with me or you're not. Amen. Amen? Amen. So, I guess a lot of this is, we need to just jump in. We need to jump in and be who Christ is calling us to be. We have to jump in and do the things that he tells us to do, say the things he tells us to say, and don't worry about what's going to come afterwards. Because all, that, all of those scriptures were saying, guess what? The people who you think are going to be in your corner when you stand up and say, I love the Lord, they're going to tell you. Those are the people who are going to turn their backs on you. Those are the people who are going to talk about you the worst. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who will deny that you have any power in Christ at all. Those are the people who are going to say, I remember when you used to do this. I remember when you used to go over there. But it's not about what I used to do. It's about what I'm doing right now. And it's about me serving God. Right? Yes. Right. And so Amen. what people tend to do is they shove God out of their lives. Because they have other guys. They may say they don't, but they do. Because a person will get up and go to work every day of the week and not come to church on Sunday. They will go to work instead of coming to church because they feel that obligation. And I know that story all too well because I've done it. You know, it is required by our jobs to work every other weekend, correct? If we don't go, we get in trouble. But we forget that there's an eternity after this life. If we don't do the things of Christ, there are some things that are worse trouble than what that job can do to us. Amen? You know, people deny Christ because he interferes with what they want. There's things in this life that I may want, and God may say, no. That's not what I have in store 
for you. So if I choose to pursue those things, now I'm denying God the ability to do other things in my life. I'm denying God the ability to use my life for what he wants to use it for because I have a want. Right? Yet, it is ultimately because the way of Christ is too demanding. You want me to tell the truth and nothing but the truth to help me, God, all the time, every single day of my life, in every situation and circumstance, God will stand up and say yes. You want me to always do the right thing, even when no one is looking, when no one else is around, and when it's only me? God will stand up and say yes. The way of being a Christian for so many people is too hard. But what they don't realize is we have a grace that will help us. And the moment you stand up on the principles of God, that's when the moment that grace will stand up and help you keep standing. When you thought that everything around you was going to fall, when everyone around you has turned their backs on you, you told the truth and everyone else lied, and it seems like you're the one getting in trouble for it, that's when that grace shows up. Mm -hmm. And things change. And all of a sudden you find yourself on top and you have no idea how you got there. You just know you're there. Amen? That is Amen. because we have put the line of separation. I have set myself aside. Father, I am for you. I am for Christ. I allow the Holy Spirit to use me. And because I allow the Holy Spirit to use me, I have to be separated from some things. He says, with this, people are going to persecute me. But there's a blessing in that. When you look at how bad Jesus was persecuted and ridiculed, but yet he still reigned supreme, yet he's still the victor. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, Christ, he divides between religion and relationship. Bless you. Some people only go to church because of who they go to church with. Mm -hmm. But even still, some people only go to church because this is what my mom did, and this is what my daddy did, and I'm just going to go. I have nothing else to do on Sunday, so I'm just going to go. But Jesus divides that stuff. He transforms the former from the latter. Because thank God none of us are who we used to be. And then guess what? A couple weeks from now, I'm not going to be the same person that you see me standing, that you see standing mm -hmm. before you now because I am continually allowing the Holy Spirit to change and transform some things in me. He sets a separation between the secular and the sacred. Our world today would like for us to have a plain line. Everything is on equal territory, whether it's of the world or whether it's of God. And God said no. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. So therefore, we cannot have a plain line. We cannot say that everything is equal. Because it's not. Because then you're going to say that evil is equal to good. And it's not. Jesus set that separation. But he put the separation between temporary and eternal. What we're doing right here, right now, this will fade away. You know, there'll come a time when I won't see your faces, you won't see my faces, whether it be by way of the grave or we, our lives take us in separate directions. These things will pass away. The Bible even tells us that heaven and earth will pass away. But there's some things that won't pass away. God and his word will never pass away. Our eternal spirits will be with him. When this earth passes away, our eternal spirits will be with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So if we should gain this world alone, that's all we got is this world. And God wants us to set our stakes a little bit higher. Set our stakes on him. He says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there's nothing wrong with having riches and houses and cars and nice clothing. There's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not where our hearts should be at. Our hearts should be set on the kingdom of God. Amen. And then if we might by some way obtain those things here on earth, enjoy them. Amen? Amen. But know that those things are temporary. Houses fall. Cars break down. Clothes wear out. The the kingdom of God will always remain. So, 
Christ, because he did not come with peace but with the sword, he put a great divide between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms of this world. There is still a divide to this day between church and society. We see it all the time. And that is partly why pastors don't stand up and say anything because that has nothing to do with the church, so we're going to stay over here mm -hmm. when we ought to be speaking up. He put a, a, a distance between the saved and the unsaved. But not to say that we are supposed to leave the unsaved out there. We're not. We are supposed to go and make disciples of all the land. However, we're not supposed to be like them. Mm -hmm. Someone should be able to look at me and my lifestyle and know that it is different from the ways of the world. So, to openly confess Christ, I'll be honored by Christ and God, but the world will not honor me. Because they don't understand it, they don't get it, and they don't want to. And our Heavenly Father will recognize us. While that open denial will receive the same consequences. If you openly say you don't believe in Christ, you don't believe in God and all that good stuff, that's what he's going to say the same thing. So the conclusion of this, this section presents claims of discipleship. A true disciple will do this. When you look at the mighty, mighty men and women in the Bible, they put themselves in a position to where, give me Christ or give me death. Mm -hmm. If you want me to deny my Christ, you might as well kill me dead now. Because that's one thing I won't do. Many of them, he, the, um, one of the prophets in the old days, you know, he said, oh, let me bury my father. No, let the dead bury the dead. Mm -hmm. You pick up your cross and follow hard after me. And that means, guess what? While I'm following hard after Christ, if my family decided one day and said, guess what, mind you nothing, I'm not going. I have a choice to make. Do I stop doing what I'm doing to stay at home with the rest of my family? Or do I tell my family, well, your choice is made, my choice is made as well. Maybe one day you'll pick up the cross and follow after me and we're going to see Christ. Maybe you won't. We have to make those decisions. So, number one, to be worthy of Christ, we are to put him first in all family relations. Yeah. You hear about people all the time who say they don't talk to their children, and a lot of times you try to figure out why and how this happened. But then you see other situations to where families are doing so much for these children. Why? Because they put Christ first. And because of whatever Christ has told them to do in those family situations, they're doing that. In some situations, Christ will say, Leave them alone. Follow after me. Don't worry about them. I will take care of them. But in other situations, he will say, carry them. Keep them. Protect them. Love them. Guide them. Do this. Do that. And when you follow that plan that he has, it will all, be, it will all work out. Number two, to be worthy of Christ, we are to take up his cross. Not our cross. A lot of times we like to make our problems be the cross. And it's not. We are to take up his cross which means we are proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He died on the cross and he rose three days later for us. That is the cross that we pick up. Not, oh, I'm poor and broke and suffering for Jesus. That is not the cross. Amen? We are to accept the scandal of identification with him. From the moment Jesus stepped on the scene, there has been a scandal. But thank God for grace. Throughout it all, Christ has always came out on top. To be worthy of Christ, we are to choose him and his life, whether, rather than selfishly choosing our own way. A lot of times, you know, honestly, I can think of a lot of other things to do on a Sunday afternoon. But this is what Christ has chosen for me to do in this day and this hour. And as long as he's telling me this is what I'm going to do, then this is what I'm going to do. Amen? So, there's a division because of him. Decisions have to be made because of him. And a declaration has to be made because of him. Christ divides between us and the loyalty to the world. Because the loyalty to the world will say, oh, you have to work every other weekend. And we will rise up and say, no, I have to do this. So now there's a decision that has to be made. References, preferences of family relations. I could probably find a whole lot of family members I can hang out with in this moment. 
but my relationship with Christ is more important. And then three, the pursuit of status in a self-centered occupation. By profession, I am a registered nurse. However, that profession cannot get in the way of me being God's spokes lady. Amen? Mm -hmm. If it gets in the way of that, then I step away from a profession that I chose for me. And I walk in the profession that God has chosen for me. When I walk in the profession that God has chosen for me, my life will be way more prosperous than what it could ever be, being a nurse. And by way of prosperity, it's not always counted in the dollars that's in your bank account, more so than the soul that's in your heaven account. So now we're going to move forward here. We're going to go to the reward of serving Christ. Because a lot of times what I just described, that's what people hear. And it's like, oh my God, that is so awful. I can't walk away from all of that. But there's a reward. So we're going to come from Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42. It says, he who receives you, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. That's a whole lot of words to say, when you receive someone who is coming in the name of the Lord, you're receiving the Lord. And by receiving the Lord, you're receiving our Heavenly Father. Amen? He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. A lot of times when we do things, we do them because we want someone to think that we got it going on. We have made it. You know, by me saying, oh, I'm an RN. For some people, oh, you got a great degree, you got a great job, you got this, you got that, but no one knows what's really going on behind the scenes. But a lot of times these decisions and these choices are made to look good before men. And if that's the reason that they're doing these things, then that's the only reward they will have. They will have that reward that a whole lot of people say, yay, they're such great people, they do such a great job. When that's not where our reward should be coming from. Our reward should be coming from our Heavenly Father. Then we should be patiently awaiting the day that we get our heavenly rewards as well. So in this section, Jesus is stating that a person who receives the messenger, the one who is providing the hospitality, not the messenger, is in fact doing a service for Christ. Because there's a lot of times when you want to give a message that Christ has for someone and they won't receive it. So now, not only did they do a disservice to us, but they hurt your feelings. But they just denied Christ by denying you the opportunity to even give it to him. So, he is, if he receives it, he's receiving Christ. We have to think of this thing like a team. When you have a team sport, Michael Jordan, because that was my era when I was into all the sports and stuff. You know, you had all of these NBA championships that happened in a row. You know, we had the three people, we had the four people. We did all of these championships. But did Michael Jordan step out there on the court by himself? No. No. He had four other men on the court with him at all times. There was times he sat on the bench too because he needed a rest. And when they got the championship, everybody hit the court, right? Everybody rejoiced. No matter if they got 40 minutes of playing time or four. Everybody rejoiced. Everybody got that same ring. Everybody got that same bonus check, correct? Amen. So when we are a part of God's team, we are all celebrating the same victory that Jesus got. When Jesus defeated Satan, death, and hell, guess what? We did too. And so because of that, we should be out on the court celebrating our victory all the time. For there is a difference between being a victor and being someone who's defeated, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, us as Christians, we walk around as if we're defeated, forgetting that we actually have the victory, amen? And then I like that part where it talks about giving a cup of cold water. So let me just point out here that there is a big difference in just giving a cup of cold water or giving a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. Because anybody can do something nice. Anybody can do a good deed. However, when you do something in the name of the Lord, there is a huge difference. 
When you do something that's in the name of the Lord, you're not doing it for your own selfish gain. You're not doing it to do, look good in front of somebody else. You're doing it primarily to show the love of Christ. So this section stresses the identification of Jesus for an effective mission, no matter what your mission may be. It identifies Jesus with the Father. It makes a divine connection there. These two are one, and if you accept one, you accept the other. Jesus then identifies with the disciple. If you accept Jesus as disciple, you accept him. Then Jesus identifies the reward of service. If you accept these things, you will be rewarded. And what he's doing here is he's preparing our hearts for persecution. Because when you believe in Jesus, you will be persecuted. And so he's basically letting us know, you are to fear God more than you fear men. You are to confess Christ openly. We're not supposed to be like Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. We are supposed to openly confess that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. And not just confess it with our mouth, but live it out so that it is seen in our day-to-day -day lives. And then we are to accept the, the separation of discipleship. Because a lot of us, we live good lives and all that, but you look up on Saturday night, they're in the club. And then they will get up in the morning and go to church the next day. How they do it, I don't know, because I need to sleep. But people will do that. They haven't completely separated themselves out. You know, and it, it's a process. It truly is. And then we're to serve compassionately in the name of Christ. Serving compassionately means I'm not just showing up because I know this is what I'm supposed to. I'm showing up with a heart for service. I'm showing up to serve, to do what God wants me to do. I remember there was a time I walked up to a pastor and I told her, I said, you just let me know what you need. And she was like, when I have a service, I'll let you know. And I'll invite you. I said, no, there's more to running a church than having people come speak. If you need me to come and wash it, clean your toilet, I'll do that. And she goes, you know, no one has ever offered that to me. Because there's more to having someone put a, a, a microphone in their hand. There's more to serving Christ than just speaking to people. And honestly, the speaking to people is a very small part of the service to Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move to Jesus' answer. Because John the Baptist had asked a question. He sent his disciples, and I'm going to paraphrase it because it's a lot of scriptures. It's um, actually Matthew 11, verses 1 through 9, 19, I'm sorry. And basically what happens in these scriptures is that John the Baptist sent some of his disciples over to Jesus after all of these teachings took place. And they asked him, are you the one that we're waiting for? Because they knew a Messiah was coming. They knew a Savior was coming, but he didn't come in the way they expected him to come. They thought he was going to come, he was going to tear up some stuff, and he was, he was going to reign supreme. He was going to be this great and mighty king, and he came humble and meek. And so what Jesus told them was the lame, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dumb talk. You, know, you go back and you tell him these things. And so what Jesus was basically telling them was, you know, John was looking for proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Give me the proof. I want to know. Basically, he wanted a true yes or no answer. And Jesus didn't give him that. Jesus gave him the things that has been done by him, and now you decide whether or not you're going to believe it. And that's what he's doing for us. Everything that is written in the Bible, those are evidence. That's evidence. And so when you have evidence, now it's up for you to believe it or not believe it. That's called walking in faith. Amen? And so when you walk in faith, you are accepting Jesus' evidence as he is who he is. And when someone accepts you, that's what they're doing. They are accepting the evidence that you are presenting before them as truth. Because nowhere in the Bible are you going, I mean, he does confess a couple of times that he is the son of man. He is the son of God. But even with that confession, you're going to have people on this side of it that says, yeah, he's true. You're going to have people on this side that says, no, he's not. Whenever you have any type of call, 
any type of religion, any type of anything that someone has a, a choice, you're going to have people on both sides. And you're going to have to evaluate these things and make a choice. You're either going to be for it or against it. So while John was asking for proof of Jesus' messiahship, Jesus, instead of offering proof, gave him evidence. The walk of faith most often means that we accept the evidence in place of proof. So the only thing that really comes to mind is like you have a child and who's the father is in question. Now mom will present some proofs. They look just alike. They talk alike. They walk alike. This, that, and the other. But what would truly solidify it would be a DNA test. You have some fathers who will be like, I was there, I did it, it was my, it's my kid. You have others who they want to know, yes or no. But if you ever look at a paternity test, it will never tell you 100% accuracy on who's the father. It will tell you 99.9% .9 because you always have mom's DNA thrown in there as well, so they cannot rule out mom's DNA, so they cannot 100% tell you that this is your child. So even with that, you still have to have a small inkling of faith that this is your child. So God, in himself, God is his own proof that he is who he said he is. Because without him, none of us would be here. None of any of this would be here. So we have to walk this thing out in faith. In Jesus' statement, it focused on his authority to reinterpret the messianic expectation, saying... Blessed is he who is not offended by me. Amen? So, the basic ob observations of this is in grace. Because grace is at work when miracles happen. Amen? Grace is at work when all of these things, when Jesus is announcing himself, grace is there. And grace is its own evidence. And it's up to us to recognize that grace is at work in us. So, Yet, all of these miracles took place, people still doubt it. Because faith is personal. And it's the response to evidence. And we all, it tells us all, we have to work out our own faith with fear and trembling. Amen? So, Jesus said that he sent his messengers, that God sent his messengers. But all the people, but all the people did was criticize. Because people always were looking for answers. And when God sent someone with the answers, they criticized him. They said that John the Baptist was a madman because he fasted. He ate locusts and honey. He wore camel's hair. He had to be crazy. But the reason they did that was because they wanted to make merry at those times. They wanted to party and have a good time. When John the Baptist, when he came out, he was telling them to repent. And he was preparing the way of the Lord. And he was trying to get them ready to receive God's Christ. And they said that Jesus was a radical. And then something had to be wrong with them because he didn't separate himself. He ate with sinners. He had tax collectors following him. And that's because the people at that time, they wanted to play with the kingdom. They weren't serious about God's kingdom. They were using God's kingdom for their own selfish gain. So the judgments that Jesus expressed were pity. You know, a lot of times he would say, woe to this or woe to that. And a lot of times when we hear those words, woe coming out of the Bible, we're like, uh-oh, doom and gloom for them. But it really wasn't that. It was more of sorrow and pity than being angry. Because Jesus saw what was going to happen to these people if they did not turn, if they did not repent, if they did not make the choice to follow after him. And so, with the comparative symbols that suggest God's judgment, they're conditioned by the amount of opportunity. So, if we went a little bit further in, chap in chapter 11, Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazon! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For the mighty works which were done in you, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, 
and would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. These things are happening because God will always give opportunity to repent before judgment happens. So he sent out in the beginning what we talked about was the commission. Make a choice. And then after you make the choice, follow through. Live that life. And then if you don't, now here comes the woe. Amen? And so when you have the opportunity, you had, there was a, this, a story that comes back to mind. It was more like, it was always told as a joke. And a flood came. And this man prayed for God to save him from this flood. And so a person came by and knocked on the door and was like, hey man, the flood is coming. We got to go. And he said, no, you go ahead without me. God's going to save you. So then the waters rose up to about the, the, his rooftop. And here comes a man in a boat. And he says, get in my boat. Let's go. And he says, no, God's going to save you. So then, you know, it's to the point to where he can only stand on his roof. And a guy comes by in a helicopter and he says, hey, man, come on, let's go. You know, the flood waters are still rising. He says, no, God's going to save me. Well, we know what happens. The man dies in the flood. He gets to heaven because he believes in God. He does. And he finally gets to talk to God, and he said, hey, what happened? I was waiting for you to save me. He said, I sent the man on foot. I sent the man by boat. I sent the man in the helicopter. You didn't take it. So a lot of times, because we have this ideal in our head of how God is going to show up, how God is going to perform, we miss the blessings that's right before our very eyes. The opportunities are always there. It's up for us to take the opportunity. Amen? And so the warnings here had three perceptions. Number one, responsibility. Someone is responsible for telling you about the opportunity. If no one tells you, you don't know it's there. But then you have a responsibility to listen and know that there's an opportunity there. Number two, accountability. As they have been given more in the, uh, in the understanding of God than the rich merchant cities, Tyree and Zion, but they still didn't make the right choice. And number three, opportunity. They knocked, they didn't open the door. And a lot of it was because this was Jesus' hometown. He grew up in that area. Everyone knew that this was the carpenter's son. Everyone knew Mary. Everyone knew his sisters and his brothers. And because of that, this is just Jesus. He learned a couple of the scriptures. They never took him for who he really was. And a lot of times we will find that, which is why families oftentimes walk away from a person who says, I'm going to I'm gonna preach the gospel. They're going to say, ha ha, not you. You know, because they know who you are. And so we have to take the gospel as it has been given to us because the Bible is our opportunity. We read it, we learn it, we live it. That is our great opportunity. Then we have people who come by our lives and actually break it down and give us a little bit more depth and a little bit of insight, which is what the gospel writers were doing. They were not trying to make the gospels be an exhaustive, all-inclusive of everything Jesus did. This is not a step-by-step step of everything that Jesus did. They basically took out, they, I shouldn't say took out, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit in selecting the teachings and the events that would convey a valid and adequate understanding of Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And it is up to us to believe it. The sections were inspired by the Holy Spirit and they adequately present the gospel which is the good news of Christ, that he has come. He has come to save the world. But we have to understand that when Jesus stepped on the scene, the world was in crisis, much like we are today. In need of the Savior, much like today. Amen? It was the best time to show up for some people, but it was the worst time for him to show up for some people, much like today. Amen? I believe that there are radicals right now who are going to be on the rise. There are going to be people like John the Baptist who are going to be called mad men, mad women, because they're preparing the way of the Lord. 
There are going to be people who are going to stand up and preach this gospel like never before in places that you would never believe the gospel would be preached. But that is because we have a world that is in crisis right now. We have a world that is completely divided. You are either for Christ or against Christ. And the only person who can truly clean this thing up, we're, got, we're helpers on this team, but the only person who can truly clean this thing up and make it be what it's supposed to be is Christ himself. So we have to take the Holy Spirit and allow Jesus to work in us like never before, no matter where we find ourselves. We have to, we're going to see the scriptures come to life right before our very eyes. And honestly, I can't wait to see it happen. Amen? So right now, on today, I urge you all to stand up, answer that great call. You know, a lot of you might think that, hey, I'm here in this building, but there's work to be done here in this building. Mm -hmm. You got to start speaking to each other. You are healed in the name of the Lord. You are healed by the stripes of Jesus. Blind eyes will see. Deaf ears. People will rise up and walk. Amen? Amen. So, and it's going to happen soon and very soon. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word that has gone forth, Father. Father, we thank you that it will not return to you, Lord. In Jesus' name.